Welcome back to another episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler, and on today's episode, I interview Jim White and Tom Yeager, two grassroots politicians trying to make a name for themselves in their local community. Now sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. What is up, podcast land? Welcome to another episode of the Two Dates in the Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. Before I introduce these two gentlemen right here, Jim White, Tom Yeager, who you guys are going to love. They're uh, local guys here outside of uh, Philadelphia, running for local office, um, just grassroots guys who are just trying to do the right thing for their community. So we'll tell their story in a little bit. Um, but where can you hear the podcast? Pretty much anywhere, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, iHeart, you name it, that's where you can find the audio version of the podcast, all I ask is that you click the subscribe button and the automatic download button. So that helps me as far as my metrics and understanding who is actually downloading the show. Um, where can you learn more about me personally? You can go to mattkubler.com. Uh, that's my name.com. And you, if you want to learn more about my life, you can get a copy of my book, A Brother's Love, a Memoir, that I wrote 15 years ago. Um, it's my life story growing up with my brother, Andy, who was autistic and had a severe stuttering problem and just growing up in low-income housing with a single mom and all that stuff that goes with the life story. Um, that's the greatest accomplishment of my life, of my life um, because my brother sadly died in 1989 in a car accident. And uh, it's a, that's a tribute I could ever do for him is to share our story so people now know who he is many, many years later. So if you want to learn more about me, go to mattkubler.com. All right, without further ado, Jim White, Tom Yaker. What's up, guys? Hey, what's up, Matt? Thank you for having us. So let's... Let's first say, what in God's name are you two thinking running for public office in this climate that we're in? It's it's like it's like playing with firecrackers when you're nine and seeing who could hold on to it the longest, right? This is what politics is like in 2020, 2021. Jim, why did you decide to uh, make this leap? So I've been involved in politics in one way or another in Montgomery County for uh, some time. I was actually a delegate to the uh, uh, 2016 convention, uh, Republican delegate uh, for the Trump convention in Cleveland. And uh, politics actually runs in my family. My great uncle was a congressman in Philadelphia for 22 years. So it runs in my blood. But more importantly, I live in this community. I've lived in Upper Providence Township for 14 years. I have two kids that go to school in, at um, uh, Spring Ford, and we're not going anywhere. We love this community, and what we see is going on here um, with a lot of reckless spending, and we'll probably talk about at some point during the podcast here, but um, Tom and I both felt as though it was time for us to step up, and we're two fiscal conservatives that really want to put a clamp on spending in this township, and that's really where it stemmed from. Um, and as we've gotten out to talk to the voters, it's just been unbelievable. The reception we've gotten, uh, people think the same way we do as far as fiscal responsibility is concerned. And um, no, that, that's kind of why we went ahead and did it. We're in a primary battle, as we'll talk about. Um, and uh, I'll let turn it over to Tom and let him talk about himself and why he's running. Yeah, no, thanks for having us on, Matt. And Grassroots. I'm I'm a grassroots guy. I've, I've never run for election before. This is my first crack at it. Um, been friends with Jim. I follow politics close. My wife and I are, are fiscal conservative Republicans. Um, and as I started kind of seeing, I've lived in the township now for 10 years, my wife for 14. And as I've kind of uh, lived around here for 10 years, I've been noticing the radical growth that's been going on, uh, not just here, but around us as well. King of Prussia, um, so really started diving in, been watching the supervisor meetings since they've been since they've been taped because of COVID. I've had the opportunity to watch them at my leisure and and really started raising a lot of questions. So for me, I met up with Jim um, and kind of started bringing this idea forward. He had the same idea. We had the same passion together about it. So, uh, you know, it was probably what, September, October last year. We said, Let, let's do this. And, and so we started making plans to go after it. Uh, who am I a little bit? Uh, met my wife, Christina. Uh, she had three kids when I met her. Uh, we had twins together. So her and I are raising five children. Um, all five are in Spring Ford. So we're not going anywhere. I'm, I'm in Upper Providence Township for a long time. Um, my current role, I'm a vice president of supply chain at a Fortune 500 company, which I'll, I'll, I'll not name on this podcast. But um, I sit on two management teams. 
And what I do is I got to the position I'm in, not because of my credentials, but because of my ability to listen and to lead. And, uh, and I take passion in that at work. I take passion in supporting my teams and supporting uh, the business. Uh, I don't lead from the top down. I lead from the bottom up. And that's the way I've been successful. Uh, strengths are strategic planning. I, I live and breathe strategic planning. Uh, we think about long range plans in the, in the business. And, and I'd really like to take those skill sets and contribute them into the, uh, into the community here and take the chance to listen take the chance to uh, hear what the community really wants and, uh, and serve them from the bottom up. I, I, that, that's truly how, how I, uh, how I like to lead. Well, you've totally screwed my entire lead in with who is Tom Yeager? Christ. All right. So Jim, you're going to have to save us, brother. You're going to have to save us. Who is Jim White? So as I mentioned, I'm a fiscal conservative. Um, I'm a businessman, right? Tom and I are not politicians here. We're, we're businessmen. We're family men. We're taxpayers, just like the residents of Upper Providence are. So my background is cybersecurity. I've been in cybersecurity for over 25 years. Um, my wife is an entrepreneur. She owns her own company in cybersecurity. So um, that's kind of what I do from a, from a business perspective. And, um, you know, I've coached youth sports in Upper Providence, Spring Ford basketball. I've coached my daughter um, uh, six years. Um, I've been involved in youth sports um, and just really enjoy it, really enjoy this community. And, you know, Tom and I have walked around this community. I mean, we, we've knocked on a lot of doors and have talked to the voters and the, and the uh, taxpayers and the residents of the township. We live in a beautiful community here. I mean, it is, there are pockets of this community that we, I, I haven't driven, you know, by, and we're touching all these different pockets. And I mean, there are some beautiful developments here. So um, it's really nice to see the whole picture of the township when you get out there and you actually start talking to people. Um, but that's who I am. Um, you know, I kind of talked about my family background, you know, a few minutes ago. I grew up in Bucks County um, and I've been out in the Montgomery County area, uh, as I said, in this community, Upper Providence for 14 years. You know, the, the cool thing that I've learned, and, and I, I mentioned to guys off the air that I ran for as a write-in for state legislator in the 146th, which is not where you're running is, is a different district than, than where I ran. Um, but I learned real quickly as a write-in candidate, not even on the ticket, how aggressively vile politics can be. And... And I'm still feeling it to this day. They're still coming after me. I'm not a politician. I'm not running for office. I just happen to have a platform and a voice that they find offensive on the other side of the aisle because I don't care about what they think I think. I have the, the right under the First Amendment to share my thoughts and feelings and my opinion. And I'm a firm constitutional re Republican conservative. Um, there are certain things that are just non-negotiable and the Constitution is certainly one of them. The other one is my morals and integrity, and my faith. And when you have strong convictions, that scares people. How do you guys um, manage and balance? Um, you know, running for you know, obviously running for township supervisor is a little bit different than running for state officer or or running for Congress. But the it's just a, a micro versus a macro, right? You still have the same nonsense occurring in in the political realm and in the, the backbiting and the all that stuff that happens during a political race. And then while you're in office, it's just in a smaller communal size bite. How, how are you guys planning on managing that balance between being a tax paying resident, your, your family and home life, your um, business life, and then your essentially, I mean, I, I don't know if Upper Providence pays a stipend or not, but essentially you're a volunteer helping to run your municipality. How do you plan on balancing that? Jim, I'll start with you. Um, so I'm good. You know, we're running a campaign here, right? So, you know, on top of work, this is this is close to a, you know, not a full-time job, but there's a lot of time and effort into it, n nights and weekends and working with volunteers and fundraisers. So, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big like scheduler and planning things out. And, you know, so whatever is involved in the township in that job, I wouldn't be taking this role on um, and trying to run for this office if I didn't feel like I could handle it, you know, with what I have going on in my life. And, you know, Tom and I, our position has been here 
we're going to put the residents first, right? Uh, you know, and, and that's really what's not happening here. Um, you're seeing a lot of um, elitist kind of actions against the residents when they come and they speak about a passionate issue. And it's very disheartening to watch on a lot of the videos that we've seen, the replays of these township meetings. And I mean, that's the bottom line is we're not going to put developers first um, like we've seen in the township. We're going to put the residents first. And it's time to put the residents and the taxpayers first and listen to them. There's some great ideas from some of these meetings that happen from residents. They just get put on the side. They don't even get on a put on a parking lot sheet. Rose up there for a second, fella. In their own backyard in their township. And um, that's another thing that we want to try to solve as well is give those residents more transparency. Nobody has time to watch a two hour plus Zoom meeting, a, a replay of a township meeting. There needs to be a better way of transparency and highlighting the things that happen in those meetings that if somebody wants to dig in a particular issue, it's right there in front of them. They can dig into it without having to watch a two hour meeting. So that's kind of uh, what my plan is on how I'm gonna balance this and kind of what we're gonna do um, again. What about you, Tom? Yeah, the balance, you know, uh, I'm passionate about my work. When I do something, you know, I've been told I go all in. I don't, I don't go half in. So um, I'm all in on this as much as I'm all in. So my work, I, I know that I've, I've done that for 22 years and I'll continue to support my career and I'll continue to work hard there. I'm going to continue to work hard at this as well. And, but I can't do it alone. Jim's a huge support. He and I work very well together. Um, so he's a good support system. So running together, I think is we keep each other motivated and, and very excited about this. So that's fun. Um, my wife and his wife, tremendous support behind the scenes. Couldn't do this if my wife wasn't supportive. His, his wife, Tracy, is an, is an amazing woman. So, uh, so really appreciate their support. So that helps out a lot. You know, funny story, the other night we were out um, knocking on doors and meeting people. And my son sent me a little video. And my son, he's nine years old. And he sent me a little video of him putting our um, our white Jaeger signs out in, out in the yard. And, and unfortunately, our HOA doesn't want doesn't doesn't allow us to solicit like that so uh so I got home and they had taken it down I said oh hey buddy I was like I saw you were putting it out I was like just so you know we're not supposed to do that but um so so I didn't want you to get in trouble and he's like oh dad I just wanted to support you I, I think it's cool what you're doing so you know those little moments like that are pretty awesome um so that's the home and that's the work and that's the balance and the passion but I got to tell you, the more we talk to people, the more motivated we get. Uh, you know, you sometimes you sit and, and we've watched what's happened to the political landscape at the federal level and, and at the state level for the last year or more uh, really takes some twists and turns. And, you know, it's really nice to get out and talk to other conservative Republicans and, and know that you're not alone. So the more we talk to people, I really feel like there's a growing momentum in this that you know, just kind of is exciting. So at first it's like, wow, we got a lot of doors to knock on and it felt like work. Now it's like, hey, let's go knock on the doors. And it's kind of an exciting, an exciting thing to do now. So it's pretty cool. One of the things you said that really hit home to me and it's, you know, I, I have, you know, I'm a cop. I own the businesses. I still own a business. I do podcasting. I'm launching a new podcast network. Like there's, I'm always doing something. I'm constantly active. My brain, my, my body needs to always be in motion. And without my wife and my kids, my granted, my kids are older, 18, 23. Um, and my wife, who is literally, she might be Mother Teresa reincarnated. But <laughs> without without that and without that, and it's not like they support you because that's their, their role or their duty or their, their responsibility to do so. It's that truly believing in you. Like when your son sent you the video, you know, that's that. Yeah, OK, now I know I'm doing the right thing kind of moment. And, right. you know, my, my son's 18 and I'm, you know, when you said I go all in, people say I'm a bit much. That's like the words that always come out of something like Matt Cooper, like, yeah, he's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> and I take it as a badge of honor, right? Because that just means that I'm, I'm a hundred percent when I, you know, I'm like a pit bull on a, on a piece of meat. I'm not letting go. But I also, you know, I also have this emotional side and, and I wrote a book about my life with my brother and you know, I'm, I'm multifaceted as a human being. And depending on what the task is in front of me is the person that I 
present to it and what's required. And I think as a, you know, what I'm hearing from both of you is that you both have this um, adaptability to be more than just a one trick pony person, right? In politics, you know, there's pretty much in politics, it's a one size fits all, you just change the letter. Yep. Right. And and to me, that's what's so disheartening about what's going on. And, and during the whole 2020, 2019, 2020, and everything that was going on in our country in the actually probably since 2016, I was starting to lose my faith in America. And I'm a veteran, you know, four years armed Persian Gulf veteran. I served in combat. I, I've given my life to this country from 50 years old. I've been doing this for 32 years. And I was starting to really get disheartened because I'm like, what has happened to this thing that I would have died for? And then I really had to take a step back and, and think to myself, what is America? America isn't government. America was an idea that was then drafted into a piece of paper called the Declaration of Independence, which then became the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. That's America. That has never changed. That has not been flawed. That has not been um, found to be deficient or flawed in any way. It's the people that are manipulating the edges in the ruling class that have really screwed us over. The, the common upper Providence Township taxpayer, everyone on both sides of the aisle. And what I think people need today is somebody when they come and knock on the door and they shake their hand, they give them a firm handshake and they say, you can trust me. I'm not going to be that. And I see that in both of you. And I'm not saying because I'm friends with Jim. I just met you now tonight, Tom. I can see your sincerity and your authenticity in both of you. And I think that's important. You know, Jim, when he gave us, uh, we had a thing a couple of weeks ago and, you know, when he gets passionate, he gets kind of emotional when he talks and, and that, that's real. That's not something that you just create out of nowhere. You're not some glad hander kissing babies, handing out hands, right? You're, you truly want to do something positive for the place where you live. And I yep. think that's the thing that resonates with me, just in the what you guys just said. The first thing that popped out of me was authenticity and believability and, and real. Like I want to vote, I want to move to Upper Providence so I can vote for you. So <laughs> but that that to me, that's the thing though. That and I think that's what when you are because you're not you're you're in a primary, which means you're going against incumbents, right? There's there are people that already are in the same party that are running for the the, the position that are currently holding it, and you want to replace them. That's a tough. It's a tough sell. Yep. But how you get that sell is with what you're doing right now, with what you just gave me in those five minutes. If you're doing that at every door, you got a great shot. Yep. We appreciate that, Matt. Yeah. And, you know, I guess a couple uh, talking about that passion and how we relate with people. I agree. And I appreciate that you recognize that. But, you know, couple, one, one funny story. It wasn't funny at the time, but um, on Saturday, um, I got bit by a German shepherd of somebody's, somebody's house I knocked on. And, um, you know, luckily the guy was a doctor. <laughs> you know, Hopefully I, a Republican. Um, and, and, I, and he was a Republican. And I said, hey, the least you can do is put a sign on your front lawn <laughs> after that. Um, so that was one thing that happened over the weekend. But another great story that actually you talk about how, you know, I'm passionate. I am. Um, we had a fundraiser the other night and somebody said to Tom at the fundraiser, man, that guy's a bulldog, man. And he's like, yeah, he is, because when he's passionate about something, he goes after it. And, you know, I plan on doing that here. But I knocked on a guy's door yesterday. Tom, we're in, we're in a neighborhood. Guy came out, 70 plus year old guy, and he said, you know, I'm just going to tell you, I don't, I can't speak well. And I didn't really know what that meant, but we continued the conversation and we hit it off. And, you know, and the guy said, I don't like shaking politicians' hands. And I certainly don't like talking to politicians. I feel like I'm dirty after I shake somebody's hand or I talk to them. He said, again, I have a brain injury and I had, I had brain surgery. I have a, I have a dent in my head. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that. And he's like, you know, I don't know what it is. He said, I just told you, I can't talk to people. I can talk to you, Jim. Like, he's like, I can talk to you. And he's like, I haven't had a conversation like this with, with somebody. I can't tell you when, since my, since my surgery. And I mean, that just really hit home. And I got a mo I got a mo I got in the car with Tom and we moved on and I like started tearing up. I mean, it's real. I mean, it was unbelievable to have a connection with a voter like that. I think that rings a lot to us out there, just speaking from our heart, too. I mean, we're 
hopefully people see that we're not just saying talking points. I mean, we, we really do believe in what we're trying to do here. And it's, it's exciting. And I think people want to see like, there's, so I'll give you a, a, when I was running, I wasn't running because I had any, uh, any desire whatsoever. Zero, I had, if there was a number less than zero desire to be a state representative in Pennsylvania, I had that, that was my number. But what I had was a, a vindictive personality where I just wanted to tell the governor every day with my presence, go fuck yourself. Like that's what I wanted to do every day, every single day. People saw that. They're like, well, I want a guy that's at least going to go in there and fight. Yeah. But I, I would never run for office again. Like that was a one hit wonder. That was it. Yeah. I was like, you, I was like, you know, you uh, fought, brother. I was you, like you, player, you, you know, that, that song, but band player, they had one song. It was a great song, but, um, I'm never going to have another shot at it because I don't want it. I never did want it, but I was so motivated and so inspired to go make, at least be a part of change that I was willing to take that risk. And it, and it's, it's cost me, which I knew I, there were all calculated risks I took. I was well aware of what those were. Um, what is the, you know, if you're running for, for township supervisor, it's not, you know, the president of the United States, yep. but in upper Providence township, it's a very important, position whether or not people recognize it or not people don't i don't think people truly recognize and hopefully maybe this past year or the last year or two has really increased people's political iq a little bit and understanding the value of local government and even school boards i mean i learned stuff like i didn't recognize that the you know, judge of elections it's such a powerful position until 2020 right that the judge of election says yay or nay on whether or not a vote gets counted or not. Like there's yep. so much power in these local um, positions that people would never even think of. I didn't even know it was an electable position. I just thought you worked for the, the you know, the polling office or something. I had no idea. Right. Like there's things that I didn't know about because I wasn't politically adept at that level. But what I've learned is, is that 90% of what impacts us starts at your local community level. Like your your school taxes, your property taxes, your you know how well are your roads figured off in the winter time, or or potholes being filled, or traffic lights being addressed, like all those things. Police departments, which I'm obviously a part of, yep. like all those things are are under the purview of of the local municipality. So your role and your background and understanding of how to manage and lead is vital in the success of your local community whether those people know it or not. Do you, when you're out talking to people, do you find people that really just, have you found people that are really in tune to the local politics? Or do you have people that are just sort of like, yeah, I don't know anything about this. Like, was it, what's the percentage of really out of touch and, and really tuned in? I'd say it's 20, 25% of people that are tuned in. That may be generous. There's uh, there's probably another 30, 35 percent of people that don't know anything and we kind of educate them at the door. And then there's a mixed bag that kind of know the big things. Right. There's a right. there's a there's a big development topic in the township that a lot of people are just, hey, I see this. I kind of understand. Help me understand. They know about big projects, but they don't necessarily know about um, a lot of what's going on as far as budgeting and planning and that kind of stuff. So. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty big mixed bag, but I would say for the most part, majority of people don't know more than the big things going on. Well, I think, and, yeah, go ahead, Jim, sorry. I, I was just going to say, you know, and then so a rezoning issue happens, right, of a piece of property that, you know, a developer's trying to get rezoned, you know, and a lot of these people don't know until after it's done, right? You know, right. I mean, and then they're trying to fight it with lawyers and, you know, everything else. And, you know, so... Um, again, going back to that transparency thing, I think we really need to do a better job of informing people, um, you know, and putting the residents first, you know, again, yeah. and it's just, it's just not happening. Um, so, um, everybody we talk to is like, they care, but I don't think they, they care about the national politics. Um, you know, especially the Republican doors we knock on, but you know, you don't really get them thinking about local politics until um, until you bring up what some of the issues are. I mean, 
you know, Doug Mast Mastriano was speaking at the Harrisburg rally the other day for yes, 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 the, the Pennsylvania constitutional amendment questions. You know, and he said, folks, support your local, put, put good Republicans and conservatives in your local offices at the, the township level and your city council and your mayor and all that. And um, it's right. And they are, they are some of the most important positions that we need to, that we need to get grassroots level at. And we, we as Republicans, Matt, as we talked about at the beginning of the show, before we got on, we're not, we don't do a good job of that. And we need to start doing a better job of that. Yeah, I think when I really started to take an assessment of, of how we got here, because I'm, I'm a part of what I did when I owned my gym and max out is I worked with neurological, neuromuscular clients who had strokes, uh, cerebral palsy, ALS, MS, you named it. Um, people had TB, TBIs, all kinds of stuff. So I would have to figure out how to make their arm work that wasn't working or you know, their right leg move that wasn't moving or whatever the, the issue was. And I, I always work off of a reverse engineering philosophy. Like I know where I want to be and I reverse engineer it to where I am. And it reveals the pathway a lot better than starting where you are and trying to figure out where the end is. And I think with how we got to where we are politically in our country, not just in our county and state, but in our country into this far left, radical agenda is that we stopped working the grassroots route. And that, that that's probably 20 years that it's been that. I'm getting that, it may be even longer, but the, we had such a good run of conservativeness, especially in our county, where we were, I mean, all the, all the way up until 2010, maybe, we were, our county was, was strong red county. Yep. And then it flipped on its head after Obama was elected in 08. And then this, by the time 12 came, we were 60, 40 blue. And, and you have to ask yourself, why were they so, so successful? And to be honest with you, they were so successful because they went door to door. And yeah. I don't doubt, and, and I listen, right, left doesn't matter. It, I appreciate passion. I appreciate anybody that's willing to fight whatever it is they believe in, whether I agree with it or not, it doesn't matter. I can appreciate and admire your passion. And they had passion. They would go door to door. They would have rallies. They would, you know, have food drives. They would do. They were full all in grassroots. Let's get the word out on who we are and go bottom up instead of top down. Yeah. And what I what I'm seeing from the latest you know, group of candidates from, you know, when I was doing the primary in 2018 and uh, 2020 to the people that are going to be running in May, is there's at least more of a focus or an intention to go out and do the grassroots work. And what people are gonna see in you is what people were seeing in the Democrats when they were going out the door and getting people to believe in something. The difference I hope is that you're able to deliver on the things that you're, you're actually saying you wanna do. And that's yeah. the difference I think. And that, and that just comes down to belief systems, right? So for me, when, when you say fiscal conservative, Tom, you know, Upper Providence isn't some uh, impoverished nation, right? It's a very wealthy township. Yeah. But just because you have money doesn't mean you got to go spend it all. It doesn't mean you don't have plans for the future. It doesn't mean you you sell off all your open land to the, the highest bidder. What are your thoughts, knowing that you've worked in such a large Fortune 500 type environment, um, what are your thoughts on the um, state of the economics in Upper Providence Township and how would you help improve that? No, you're right. I mean, we, we, we have a nice budget to work with. I think that it's, um, I think from what I've seen, it's turned into collect money, spend money. Um, you know, the municipality code requires us to carry a comprehensive plan. And to my knowledge and the research I've done, the current comprehensive plan expired in June of 2020. So this is something that needs to be worked on constantly, right? It's, it's not an easy thing to put together. It takes hearings. It takes community input. It takes a lot of work to put a plan in place. And one of the things that's concerning to me right now is I look and I don't, I don't see a revised plan. Um, one was supposed to be put forward in late 2020. It was not. Um, I think the next meeting coming up was just canceled again. I don't know why. I don't have those details. 
Um, but for me, I think it's a priority to create a plan, to have that community input to hear because what we're, what I'm seeing, what Jim's seeing, what we're hearing is the, the, the overdevelopment, the fast development, and we're just spending a lot of money and we don't know why is kind of the sense I get, you know, something comes up, spend money here. Oh, we have money. Let's spend it. But that's not the approach I would take. It's not, let's have money, let's spend it. What, how much money do we need and what do we want? And to me, I think we're, we have too much coming in. And maybe there's an opportunity in the future to cut back a little bit based on what the plan is, right? We got to have, we got to be balanced. We got to have some cash reserve. I get all of that. I understand budgeting. Um, but if I have 20 million, it doesn't mean I need to spend 20 million, right? Maybe I only need 18. Maybe I only need 15. You know, there's, there's a lot of things going on. Um, there, there's a, there's a new firehouse being developed in, in the township here. And I'm a numbers guy. And I see that, that, and, and from what I understand, it's, it's near $14 million now to build this. I'm all for fire. I'm all for police. I'm, I, I understand how urgently we need those things, but where's the study on the data that says by spending $14 million, I can get to a house and respond two minutes sooner. I don't see that information, right? If you tell me I can respond two minutes sooner and I'm going to save lives by doing that, I'm in, right? I'm in, let's spend the money. But I don't see that back to Jim's point of the transparency. You know, I do see in part of that $14 million, there's round the clock EMS service. And, and from what I've studied after six o'clock, the service comes from other areas and it's shared services, as you're aware. So having round the clock EMS in the township, terrific idea. I love the idea of having that. Um, did it cost $14 million to get that? I don't know. So this is, so when I get into the office, this is what, this is what I'd like to see is let's ask the right questions. Let's understand the data. Let's do some critical thinking and let's spend the money appropriately. Let's not just spend it because we have it. So that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of my position on it. Um, I think taxes have gone up a lot, um, recently, uh, the, the, the current administration just approved a, 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 an apartment complex uh, on 29 Hopwood Road, um, which is, it's, in, it's an interesting, I would love to have been more in the details of that decision-making process, because from my perspective, that brings in um, a lot of congestion. It, it brings in um, a, a base that doesn't necessarily contribute to the taxes. Do we need that or not? I don't know, but the, but the transparency and the detail isn't there, right? So when we're making these decisions, I feel like we almost got to hit the pause button. We got we to gotta redevelop the plan. You can't stop growth, right? It's not practical to think you can stop growth, but let's grow smartly. Let's, let's, let's listen to the community. You know, we don't want to be a mini city here in Upper Providence from, from what I've heard. Um, we want to be an open space, you know, very beautiful community that that isn't filled with high rises. And, uh, and uh, you know, so that's kind of my position on it is, you know, for a, I, I, I don't think you just spend what you get. You, you should understand what you need. And then that's how you should budget for it. So and I think we're probably taking in a little bit more than we need. I also think, first of all, I agree 100 percent with what you're saying. And, and I know a lot of those guys personally that are involved in the fire and the, the police, obviously. Um, you know, your new chief, I've known my entire career. We've been friends around the plot team together. Um, Mark Freeman's going to do a great job there. Um, I don't think, and I never understood this, and it's no different than the judge role. You know, you can be um, a high school graduate, shop teacher, or a plumber, or anything, and become a judge. You just have to go to a school, you know, a whatever, 12 week school, whatever it is, and then you get your magisterial justice certificate and you're hearing cases that are deciding people's lives. I just think that's a flawed process yeah. from the onset. Like the whole thing when you have, you know, law degree lawyers arguing with a high school educated person who just happened to be able to get elected, that just, it doesn't seem like the right formula for success. And on the governmental level, I think there is, there's a lack of um, overall qualification and acuity in many jurisdictions, I don't know all the makeup of who's all in Upper Province's township, but people that are making gigantic decisions. I mean, it's a gigantic company they're running, right? You're 
It's the company here. It's a multi-million dollar company running a township. And the fact that there are people that may not understand what you just outlined so eloquently, that sometimes you have to have a plan and, and understand the, the, the P&L sheet involved with that, that process itself and, and knowing where the, 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 the money's coming in from and, and how soon will that be replenished and how much do we need in reserve? Like all those things are just so vital, but yet it seems like those conversations are either had and not comprehended or not had at all. And that's the yeah. frustrating part. Um, as a taxpayer, you wonder, are these people intellectually capable of solving those complex problems? And, and I know they have solicitors and, and engineers and everybody that's on, but those are all paid people, right? Yeah. They're, they're there because they got the, the bid or whatever the case might be to be the solicitor or the, the engineer for that the, the township. Um, it's, it, the transparency part, I think there's a lack of transparency because of what I just said. They're afraid to expose their their lack of skill or understanding of of the nuances of running a government, because there is it's not just passing a law, um, having a meeting, saying no to a zoning. There's so many fine tuned nuances to running a township successfully, just because there's so much money coming in and so many needs that are are need expenditures that are are are, are required, and then you have to figure out well. What do we do with um, this road expansion? That's, you know, we got to go put that out for bid. Like there's just so many moving parts. To me, it just seems like we, we're not, we don't put in enough effort to making sure that the places where we live are run properly like any other business should be run. Yep. Jim, I know your background in leadership and your background in, in cybersecurity and understanding um, how to solve complex problems. How do you, um, explain to residents how you're different from what's already there. Like, how is that? Because I mean, it, some people may not even know who is there. Um, so you have to introduce yourself and hopefully they're not coming out as well or they don't hit that house and you get the, the upper hand by being the face they remember or the name they know. Yeah. But how do you have that conversation so that people understand, A, the importance of the role that you have or going to have and B, why you're the person for that job? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, we, we do explain to people what the board of supervisors, you know, what the role is. I'm, uh, you know, it's kind of shocking, but a lot of people don't know what the board of supervisors does in a township. So we actually explain that, um, you know, and we explain the makeup of the board, right? I mean, you know, right now, the way Upper Providence is situated is um, it's a five member board. There are uh, four Democrats on the board and there's one Republican, um, the incumbent that uh, Tom and I are running against him and his running mate. Um, he's been in office for six years. You know, so we, we, you know, we're talking about, hey, putting the best team on the field here that can win this election in November, right, is really at beyond this primary. And I, I believe, Tom and I both believe that we're the strongest team that could be put on the field. And it's important because this election in May 18th is important. But more importantly, the November election is even more important at a local level because if we take these two seats back, we're one seat away from getting a majority back in Upper Providence Township. That would be huge. Um, so the way I explain myself to people is, hey, we're not we're not politicians. We're businessmen, right? I run a business. I'm in cybersecurity technology. As you said, I, I'm, I like to solve problems. I have an entrepreneurial spirit. And, um, you know, let me explain my background, right? I've been here for 14 years. I have two kids that go to Spring Ford and it, 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 it resonates with people, right? You know, you're kind of one of them and, you know, you're, I'm not a politician and I think it, tra it translates really well. So um, that goes over well with people and, you know, they ask some questions and we educate them on what's going on in the township some of the big projects and some some of the big discussion points and make them aware of the the reckless spending that's going on. Um, and then we bring up these ballot questions, right? I don't know if you want to talk about that as well, but you know, you have these four ballot questions, these yes, yes, yes um, um, questions. People don't understand what that is. So while we're talking to these people by banging on doors, we're also making them aware of these constitution, state constitutional questions that are on the ballot, which are really important as well. So they are. I mean, I know that, you know, one of them is basically limiting the governor's state of emergency powers. It, it basically, because if you live in Pennsylvania, or as I call it, the People's Republic of Pennsylvania, um, 
when you live in this state and you've been in a constant yo-yo lockdown, give a little, take it back. You know, take two steps forward, take three steps back. That's just what our our year and at and three months has been or two months has been is this yo-yo by the dictator Tom Wolf telling us when we can and can't do anything. My business was closed permanently because of it. Thousands of others were closed permanently because of it. Thousands of people died in in, in uh, senior living centers because of it. People died and didn't get the chance to be with their loved one when they were dying because of it. There are so many ramifications for just his ability to have that power and unilaterally extend it ad, ad, ad nauseum for any reason whatsoever. Pretty much anything could be declared a state of emergency if he deemed it so and he had the legislature's approval for that first vote, then he doesn't need their approval to keep it going. So basically that first one or one of them is basically limiting that yep. and then putting putting the legislature's back in power of determining whether or not those extensions ever happen. That's correct. Um, that's a, That for me personally, because I was impacted by that, is the most yep. important one for me. You want to talk about the other one, Jim, the other big one? Uh, so the other one talks about um, e equality, yep. um, putting equality um, into the state constitution. And it's, it's kind of a baffling question because, to be honest, there's already equality clauses in the in the Pennsylvania state constitution. So it's already there for, for all of us, basically. Um, so I, I don't really understand that. But the last question talks about allowing state government agencies such as police and fire and EMS to apply for uh, state grants, which I actually wasn't aware of that they weren't able, you know, Collegeville, for instance, Matt, you know, where you work, right? Unable to apply for a state grant for, what you need for you know for the safety of the residents and your and the and you and your fellow officers, right? Um, so I don't really, to be quite honest, really understand that question. Um, I hear mixed reviews on it um, about from from other Republicans on what the answer should be there. Do you, do you have any ind indication on that, Matt? Where you, you no, understand that one? I didn't even know that was one of the questions. Um, to be honest with you, it's, that was uh, the fourth one that just got added on. It was three, and they just yeah, added this fourth we, one on. The, the event we were at, they had the three. Um, yeah, that one's a that that's a perplexing one because I, I I would have assumed that they had the ability to do that. Um, it just makes no sense to me why why you wouldn't be able to apply for state level grant. I know we we apply for federal funding all the time, whether it's through the cops program or there's a bunch of different federal uh, grants that are out there for body armor or, or new firearms or whatever. But well, and my question on that is right. You know, so in Upper Providence Township, we have three taxes on our bill for township taxes, um, you know, police, other, fire, and, you know, EMS. Um, and my question would be, so if you're able to apply for a state grant and you're, and you're getting funded by those state grants, well, can we alleviate those taxes on the taxpayers of the township, you, you know, as well? Right. That would be my question. If it does go through, um, what, how, can, how can that benefit the residents of my township and your township and the surrounding townships. Yeah, and I think when you look at that from, I mean, if we're asking that question, the people that are writing the laws are asking this question. So um, you know, they, they've thought of every what if category. And if there's a what if where a township's gonna re, you know, ask for or, or, or give back tax money to, the, to its residents or, or reduce tax burden from its residents for those things, the state will just increase Taxes somewhere else in order right. to do that. Right. So, like, I, I think it's just a, it becomes the shell game. Um, yeah. And it's, and we're always going to be the one that pays it. Like, there's yeah. never going to be a time when it's some other person, whew, well, glad it wasn't me. Like, <laughs> someone's paying it. Right. So, um, and that's where, you know, when you look at, a, at any of the free stuff, whether it was an Obama phone or, or the, the COVID money, it's not free money. You're not getting paid to stay at home. That's just our tax dollars being returned back to you. Uh, for something you didn't earn, right? So it's it's not it's not free. Nothing is free. There's always someone paying it, whether it's now or it's money that was paid before or money that we're going to pay in the future. Right. Um, that's you know I think you know people need to start to really wake up to the fact that you know when when you get your paycheck, God God help that you do get a paycheck right now, that you pay taxes and you know your your two thousand dollars is now fourteen hundred after you pay all your taxes, right? And that damn FICA guy, like. So like all those things are coming out and what are they used for? If you ask, I'd say 95% of the people that get taxes taken out of their paycheck have no idea what taxes are used for. Nope. And, and I think, you know, one of the worst things that's ever happened to our country, and I'm, you know, I'm 50 years old, so 
I, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, and I remember my education. My education was individualized by teachers, right? They, I'm sure they had a curriculum they had to teach, but how they taught it and what order they taught it and what nuanced little changes they made to it were all on them. That doesn't happen anymore. Now we have a, an education system that's cookie cutter. That's They follow a script, and it's it's this box. Like my daughter's teacher, my wife's teacher, I can, they've been doing it for years. I can tell you my mom was a teacher. It's not the same today as it was then. And I think the ability to teach nuanced stuff like taxes, what's, what are your taxes? Like, how do you write in cursive? Like, how do you balance a checkbook? Like, those things are not taught anymore. And my question is why? Like, is it because technology allows you to do it without doing it? Or is it because they don't want you to know the simple things and understand the nuances and the, 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 the fine print yep. because you're so caught up in the immediate gratification and, and that takes time? And well, I, mean, I remember, yeah, you know, when we went to school, right, um, you know, in your same age category that you, you weren't allowed to use a calculator, right? You, you had to figure it out on a piece of paper. And now it's now it's very, you know, common that uh, calculators are used in school for tests. You can ne- I could never use a calculator for a test back, you know, in the day. And now you know, they're, 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 they're allowing that to happen. So, yeah, you're right. I just think I think we've. I think it comes down to individual men and women in the family unit making decisions on how they're going to parent their child, right? There, there's got to be, and I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's important to know what kind of parent, father you are and, and husband. Yeah. Um, like for me, my wife and I made an intentional plan when we got married. Um, a, who was going to do what? Like whose responsibility was what? Like literally down to like, I'm cutting the grass, you're making dinner, I'm unloading the dishwasher. You know why? Because without blame, there's no reconciliation <laughs> there is because if if we're both looking at each other like i thought you were cutting the grass and i thought you were cutting the grass well now nobody's getting nobody's really to blame right one person just gonna have to capitulate and the other person's gonna be like yeah, got out of that one <laughs> right i don't play that game so there always has to be there has to be an answer to every problem right so i'd like to be very structured with that and that's this that was really one of the only things i'm actually structured in my life with was how i created our marriage and our our plan for our children. And my wife became a stay-at-home mom and she's been a stay-at-home mom for the most part for the last you know, 18 years. And because I wanted to make sure that the information being provided to my children, both morally, uh, faith, education, um, integrity, code issues, that they're being put in by the people that are the ones that made them, right? That was always my plan. I don't want someone else messing with the computer that's my job. I want to create the people going out into the world so that they become great contributors to society, not just consumers. And giving them those those nuanced details and understandings of things is was part of that plan. And understanding history and understanding the value of patriotism and loyalty and honor and duty and code and the name Kubler and, and what does that mean when you go out every single day and represent your mother and I. That all those things. And when people, when we would have a parent-teacher conference, they would say, your child is, I said, all I need to know is, did you ever have one problem with my kid? Yep. And if you did, I will handle it. And I always right. told my kid, I don't care if what they call me for. If they had to call me, we're, we're going to have a problem. Right. I don't care what it was for. <laughs> right, right. I, anytime a teacher has to call home, that's never good, no matter what. Very rarely do they call and say, hey, just want to give you an update. Matt got an A today. <laughs> like, that's not happening, right? So... <laughs> As parents, and I'm going to start with you, Tom, obviously you have a blended family, which creates its own, you know, adaptation requirements, right? Yep. Um, and then you had twins, did you say? Yep, or two girl twins. twins. Um, first of all, what is, what is your relationship like with your wife? And then what is your parenting um, partnership style with your raising your children? So my wife's my best friend. We uh, we always make time for each other. Friday night's date night. I told you. Well, yeah. But <laughs> right now you are. But when I go, home, <laughs> no. But uh, but I told Jim this. I said, you know, I'm I, I, because I told you I'm a numbers guy. That I laid out. All right, it takes us this long per house. We have all these houses. We broke it down. I put all the logistics. I think we have a hundred more hours if we do this. I said, but Jim, Friday night's date night for me. So me and my wife go out on Friday nights. We have dinner. It's the end of the week. We collect ourselves. We go home, watch a movie with the kids, do whatever. But that's 
that's my that's my thing. So um, so my wife and I always always make time for each other. That, that, that that's so important because if because if her and I start fraying, everything else starts fraying. So that's that's got to be first. So um, and then the way that we manage the kids. So there, there's a couple aspects. You mentioned the blended family. So. Uh, my three stepchildren, their father's in the picture, and we operate as a triangle. We we call each other, um, you know, early on a decade ago, it maybe wasn't as smooth. We had to work at it, right? And we had to come to common understandings about, you know, hey, in our household, these are my limits, and in your household, these are your limits, and the kids need to know crystal clear, these are the rules, you know? Um, we live in a funny day and age where electronics are a pain in the ass, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry for, for, for swearing. I already dropped the F-bomb when I promised you I would try to. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we learned really early that electronics and things like that are rewards. They're not, they're not just a part of your life. So, you know, I actually installed a router system where I can take each child's device and I have it grouped. And I can have timing when it can be on and when it can be off, right? So there's a time at night where the internet shuts off for their devices, for the twins. It's at nine o'clock. They know that they need to bring the iPads, the iPods, everything down to dad. We put them in one place. You don't get it tomorrow until you get home from school. Yeah, maybe it turns on at four, but if your homework's not done, you ain't getting it, right? So so we, had, we found out really early that we, we have to be very structured, very similar to what you said. Um, you got to earn it too. We don't, you know, my, my son, he, he's on Roblox and, and these other games and he wants Robux to buy this or buy that outfit. And you don't just get it. You know, he wanted a new game the other day and he came to me on Sunday and I said, all right, well, here's the deal. You do the dishes, empty the dishwasher every day this week. You help me with the trash on tonight and on Wednesday night. And if you do all that and do your homework and I don't have any issues, then on Friday night, I'll reward you with your game. And, and he did it. He worked hard at it. He's like, dad, he's like, what else can I do? He cleaned the bathroom because he thought he could get it. He could get it earlier. I'm like, I'm like, well, buddy, it doesn't work that way, but I appreciate you working hard. But I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to instill in, and nothing comes for free. You know, we, your mommy and daddy don't just provide whatever you want. You have to work for it. And you got to earn it because someday you're going to have to stand on your own two feet and you're going to have to do these things. You're going to have to be able to think critically. You're going to have to, you know, this COVID last year with the virtual learning really bothered me too, because they were even encouraged at times to go out on the internet and find answers. And I'm like, I just, I just had a fundamental problem with that. Exactly what Jim was saying. I make my kids write out their, their homework assignments. I walked in the room the one day and, and my son's going, hey, Alexa, what's 81 times five? And I'm like, no, <laughs> time out. I'm like, get the sheet of paper out. You know, he's trying to be resourceful, which I kind of like, but, but that's not going to fly. You got to work hard for what you get um, and you got to be respectful. And uh, respect is something big in our house that if you're disrespectful to mom or you're disrespectful to dad, you know, there's there's going to be a problem because if you're disrespectful in our house, how are you going to behave out in the general public? And so we expect you to behave in front of us the way that you're going to behave when you're out in front of other people and you be respectful and, and polite. And so, you know, that's that's kind of where we're at. I'm, I'm a little old school. My kids tell me I'm too tough. But you know what? I'd rather be that than not tough enough. So I love it. I love it. What about you, Jimbo? Same, same thing. Um, and I call it skin in the game, right? Um, we expect to have our kids, you know, skin in the game. I have a 15 year old that's going to be 16 in June. Um, we have an 11 year old. Um, she's going to be 12 in August. And if I didn't mention this on, on your podcast, Matt, I'll probably uh, be in big trouble with my wife. But tomorrow is our 19 year anniversary, me and my wife, Tracy. So we've been together 21. We've been married 19. And, you know, We've been through some ups and downs and tough times, you know, early on. I, I, I lost my job in, in um, technology after the dot-com bubble burst, and I was out of work for 15 months. And you know what? We lived in a brand-new townhome in King of Prussia, and we had to figure it out, and we figured it out. And we didn't rely on our parents, you know. Yeah, we spent our wedding money and everything out on our bills, but we figured it out. And, um, and a lot of faith. Um, as well. I mean, you know, our religion's big for, for us. I'm, I'm Catholic. Uh, you know, our kids are Catholic. My wife um, is Catholic. And, you know, we, we put a lot in our faith. And, 
you know, an example similar to what Tom was talking about with his kids, my youngest 11 wanted a phone. And our rule in the house is that they don't get a phone until the end of their sixth grade, you know, year. And she's in sixth grade. Well, she wanted it for Christmas. I said, and my wife agreed with me and we, we talked about it with her. We said, if you get, you know, A's or B's, um, no less than a B, uh, we'll consider it. Well, guess what? She came up short um, and she had a couple seats and, um, you know, she wanted the phone. And my wife was going to cave and give it to her. And I said, no way. I said, you got to earn it. You had the next marking period to be able to mark that up and, and get back on track. Guess what? She got all B's and an A, the, the next marking period. And we did give her that phone earlier because as Tom said, she earned it. And that's, you know, one thing that's cool about our households is, you know, we do parents similarly. Um, and we just want kids to have our kids to have skin in the game. My 15 year old works and has a job. Well, I'm not a helicopter parent, all right? That's kind of not me, and, um, you know, that's kind of it, man. Yeah. It's funny, you, you know, and I asked that question because it's – and it's it's amazing how people that are like us, you know, conservative – a lot of conservative values are reflected in how you parent, um, at least I, I think so. You know, my daughter was a, a swimmer in high school and, and went on to college and had a, had a very successful college career, and she was a six-time All-American, four-time NCAA Academic All-American – 3.9 something GPA overall. Um, but at the beginning, I said, well, here's the deal. I said, I'll pay for your college, but you have to sign a contract. And this contract states that you will maintain a 3.7 GPA and achieve all of our preset goals for swimming. Like we write them out. She was every year, my daughter would put on a stick. She had a cork board with sticky notes from the time she was a freshman in high school until she graduated college. And she would have her times and like honors that she wanted to, to win in swimming and in school. And when she would achieve one, she'd take it off, put it in a box. And at the end of the year, she would see what was left on the on the cork board and then figure out what she needed to adjust in order to achieve whatever it was that she had on that board. So I knew her mindset and how she worked. So I said, okay, I'm going to hold you to your goal lists in order for you to, to achieve the, the prize of not having college debt, then then this is how it's going to work. And and she crushed it. And you know, my son, I told him, I said, listen, same thing's going to work for you. The only thing is, is that you want to go in the military. So I'm not going to let you enlist in the military during this climate. Um, I want you to be a leader. I said, that means that you're going to go to college. I said, but if it were me, you know, I'd, I'd go to one of the military academies or get an RTC scholarship. And so I, in high school, I had an appointment to the Coast Guard Academy, but I ended up enlisting in the army like an idiot and uh, never ended up going to college. My wife you know, he kept saying he wanted to go to uh, either West Point or Naval Academy. But I wasn't seeing it from him. Like, I wasn't seeing his want for that. There wasn't effort in going out and running and doing all this stuff. Like, he was just a 17-year-old, 18-year-old kid. Like, he wasn't pushing himself, wasn't doing the extra stuff that I needed to see on his own. So, you know, I, I have friends in, in, in House of Representatives and Senate and I could have called and gotten a letter of recommendation and all that stuff. My wife's like, don't you think you should do that? I'm like, no. I'm not calling in a favor for a kid that doesn't want something. Like I'm not, I'm not going to burn that one yet. So I went to him. I said, listen, do you really want to go to the Academy? He goes, no. I said, what do you want to do? He goes, I want to go. <laughs> he goes, I want to go to RTC. I said, well, same rule applies. You got to show me you want. And, you know, we had to dig down. My son isn't, he's never had to push hard. He's me. You know, in high school, I was a smoke and mirrors kid. I am, I have a photographic memory. I have a 146 IQ, but I don't know how to work. I didn't know how to work at anything. Everything just sort of came easy to me. There was never any challenges. No one ever pushed me to be more. I always got by with a with whatever I needed to do to be the best in that moment, but never to truly succeed. Yep. So I, had, I had no retention of knowledge. I could dump information better than anybody on the planet, but I could write and I could speak publicly, but I never had any true like uh, study skills or learning skills that I ever had to employ. And he was me. And I saw that early on. I'm like, dude, he's just regurgitating information just past the test. So I had to I had to force him out of his comfort zone and make him earn what he wanted that I couldn't give him. I could just be there to support him and push him and be his his, his person in his ear, but I couldn't give it to him. Well he went and got a three year full ride for University of Maryland. So nice. Um so he's you know he's gonna go to college for like basically free and I'm gonna pay for his first year of college. Um 
in order to make sure he has the same benefit that my daughter did. Um, but he has the same contract he's going to have to sign. But granted, he's got a contract with the military that is going to weigh weighs way more than me. Um, but I I think it's it's a super important component to not only um, being a father and a husband, but also if you're going to run for office, to have that mindset and that 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 willingness to hold people accountable, and then to be accountable to the, to someone else, and and then own your shit, right? Like that's the key to, I think where, what I'm hoping comes out of all this mess over the last four years and specifically 2020 is that people start to own their shit because everybody's got an excuse. Everybody's a victim. Everybody's got some reason why they aren't where or what they wish they would be. And if you're not first looking in the mirror and saying, no, like I, I would never, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have admitted I was a bullshit artist, right? Like I would never would have, right? I would have played it off. Like I was some genius and I just didn't have to work hard. But the reality is I, that's true. I didn't have to work hard, but that, that put me back 10 years. I'll give you, a, you had a full ride to the Coast Guard Academy and I didn't go because I was definitely afraid I was going to be exposed as a fraud. Like I just knew I didn't have the chops. So I took the easier route, which is going to the army. At least I thought. I went army intelligence. I became a cryptanalyst. I was decoding things. Well, I never owned a calculator. I couldn't solve basic geometric equations. And here I am decoding Russian code and failing. I, I, I enlisted in the army to go the easy route and was failing out of intelligence school because I didn't know how to learn and retain information. Yep. And it wasn't something in math and, you know, especially anything that's not one plus one equals two or plus or minus or multiplication, anything that's not tangible, like a letter or theta or cosine, anything that's theoretical, I can't, I wasn't able to process that information. So I, had I not, had someone had just challenged me when I was 13, 14, 15 years old and forced me to have better habits and better um, study habits and better effort habits. I wouldn't have been as exposed and taken as long to be successful as I did because I had to learn all of those traits as an adult. And I think as a parent, it's our job to know where our limitations were when we were growing up and the hurdles and roadblocks that we had and try to help them prepare best to overcome them before they become a roadblock or hurdle. Does that make sense? Totally agree. Yep. And you, so, uh, you just got to be feel good to be a proud, a proud papa. I mean, that's uh, you get two good kids there and that's uh, that's a great story and love to hear those stories. I, I think and I and, and without my wife, who literally li- I listen, I'm not easy. Right. There's a lot of moving parts with me. There's never I'm never sitting still. There's always something happening and I'm always out in front of something. Intentionally. And so for to be my wife is not an easy task. But she owns that like it's her full time job and she takes pride in it. And she's a great mother. She's literally my kids. I told her if anything happens to you, we're going to be eating cereal, pizza and wearing flip flops and shorts for the rest of our lives because I don't know how to do anything else for our children. Like <laughs> that's as good as it's going to get. Yeah. Yeah, I can order food. Um, but, yeah, I think having that support network, having somebody that is your right right hand, um, your partner in crime is, is, is vital to doing what you guys are about to do. Yep. Um, when you, when you think of yourself in the role of township supervisor, at any point in time, do you see yourselves going, well, maybe I'll graduate from that and move on to higher office. Do either of you see yourselves in a position of potentially elevating your, your political career higher? Or is this a, um, doing your, your civic duty for your, 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 your local jurisdiction? Don, we'll start with you. The way I've always approached my career and I will approach this is that I, I've always just worked hard and saw what's coming next, right? So if, if the opportunity presented itself and I found myself being overly passionate, then I would listen to myself on that. I am not going into this with intentions of this being a step, right? 
That's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing this because I'm passionate to run with Jim. And I think he and I can make a real impact in the community in which we live. I love and that. that's the way I'm going into it. And, it, you know, through my career, and I say this to, to, um, to a lot of employees that I mentor and stuff, you know, you never try to shoot for the stars as you go through your career. What I've told people is I've had success by moving laterally in my career because what that did was educate myself, right? If I was in a job and I knew someday I wanted to be in the role that I'm currently in, I wasn't trying to climb to that role. I was trying to gather as much knowledge as I could because I knew I couldn't be there without it. And there was times in my career where I took lateral moves. And they, they didn't come with money. They didn't come with a new job grade. They didn't come with anything. But they came with a brand new set of knowledge. And you know what? I did well in those. And then I'd move over. You know, I'm going to go into this the same way. Am I, am I a park and recs expert? No. Am I a planning zoning expert? No. But what I am is a critical thinker and somebody that can ask the right questions and can think. Right. And I can get in there and I can listen. And I know I can ask the right questions. And if I find myself being very good and a door opens up down the road, you know, I, I, I will peek in any door that opens up in front of me. But this is not to answer your question definitively. This is not me making a step because I want to be at a higher political stage. I love that. I, I love the, the knowledge, the knowledge of yourself and how your brain operates and how your, your personality um, works. And I always say you are where you are when you're supposed to be there. And there's, you can't force that. Like, right. I agree with you do all the steps and you do all the work and you put in the energy and effort and time and energy and all that you are where you are when you're supposed to be there. And I love, I love how you described the lateral movement in order to gain more knowledge. And it's funny in my police career. So, in, and you probably don't know this in Pennsylvania, if you go from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, your time clock towards your pension goes back to zero. Huh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't so know that. I'm in my fourth agency in 28 years. I started Royce Ford Borough full-time in 1993, went to West Potsgrove Township in 1996, went federal in 2000, early 2002 after 9-11 as an air marshal, and then been in Collegeville since 2006. The only pension I have is 15 years in Collegeville. Wow. And I did that knowing that that was my, my limiting factor. But what I always told people is that at some point in time, I'm not going to be a cop. But while I'm a cop, I want to have as many different perspectives of this job as I can possibly have in order to be the very best at my job. It right. didn't mean getting promoted. I had never wanted to be a sergeant or get promoted or be chief or anything. I had never had those aspirations. I simply wanted to be the most well-rounded backup officer any cop could ever ask for. When they call and I'm the one that shows up, I want them to go, thank God it's him. Yep. And that's really what my whole career has been about. And so it's very similar to what you just said in that I wanted to have as much breadth of knowledge about my job and see, see it from as many different perspectives and angles as I possibly could so that if and I ever came across any situation that we're seeing on the news today, that I would make the right decision every single time. And that's kind of been the, the way I looked at it. And, and it's an old school way of copying. You know, police work today is very professional and, and academic in, its, in the process by which they hire and the way departments are run, um, it, there's not as much, um, I don't want to say, obviously you get knowledge by going to school, but knowledge from perspective. Like there's not a lot of shifting of perspectives to get you more engaged from different angles in the job. It's more find your niche, stay in your niche. If you're a traffic safety guy, you're going to be in traffic safety because that's where you're most valuable to that date department at that moment. So you don't get those. I and I knew that working in small jurisdictions, I was never going to have, um, you know, one role. But I also knew that I was only going to be seeing that one town, the town of Royersford, for, you know, eight tenths of a square mile or West Potsdam, 1.6 square miles or Collegeville, 1.6 square miles. But I wanted three different, completely different towns though, with different populations, different crime problems, different um, socioeconomic backgrounds. So I totally get where you're coming from with that expanding your knowledge even through lateral movement but none of my none of my movements were upward most of the time i took a pay cut every time i did it so it wasn't necessarily business-wise the best all right jim you're up what about you so i'm i'm not planning on running for 
office, you know, beyond this. This is a six year term. Um, I want to be committed to this. I'm uh, being whatever I commit myself to, I commit it to. I'm not, you know, playing on jumping the state rep or anything like that. And, you know, just to be quite honest, I mean, I'm 50 years old, six years, I'm going to be 56. I'm hoping to be in uh, in Florida shortly thereafter, <laughs> retired at the beach. So, uh, you know, to give you a quick answer, I'll probably, this is going to be it. I wanna, I'm, I'm passionate about this. I want to make a difference. The residents need to come first again, and that's one of our key pillars of, uh, of our messaging here, and Tom and I plan on doing that. I think it's great is, you know, I've been out and about since running for office, and people know who I am um, on that level, because politically I was never really active even on social media, I kept it very neutral because I was a public speaker doing inspirational speaking and all that kind of stuff going into school. Last thing I needed was me running my mouth, dropping F-bombs left and right. But, uh, you know, that's where I'm at now because I'm not doing that anymore. But I didn't see, I wasn't seeing, when I, when I would look at the candidates I voted for in the past over the last, say, the last 10 years, <clears throat> I haven't seen compelling candidates who truly just want to do the job that's put in front of them. I only see candidates who see it as the first step of a path or a journey towards higher office. And when that's the case, you lose the value that you're bringing at your first step. Like that first step becomes such a wasted step. Yeah. The taxpayers, the people that you're, you're elected to serve. And what I like to hear from people that are running for local office, especially first time people like you, Tom, is that, Hey, first of all, never say never. I, hell, I still never say never. But if yeah. somebody asked me today, would I run for office again? No. And really, I hate everybody that does it. Like, I don't like the process. I don't like the politics. I don't like the yeah. I don't like the kiss the ring component to it. Like, I don't like any of that. I'm so counter that it's it's very clear, I'm sure. But I I don't appreciate the process. So therefore, I don't see myself ever going through that process. But I like when a candidate who truly is just simply trying to do better for the people around them so that and you're one of those people that are in that mix, you know, you're not an outsider coming in. Um, I find that refreshing. And I think when you go and you get a chance to go in front of all these people when you're knocking on doors and using your spreadsheet, Tom, to figure out how many hours required to, to do it, <laughs> sure. You and I would not get along on that level. I'd be like, dude, shove that <laughs> point up your ass because I'm not looking at it, right? But you know, my, my business partner is a spreadsheet guy. I'm like, whenever it comes time, like, dude, just give me the bottom answer. I don't I don't need to know. You know just are we red or black? That's all I care about. That's all I care about. Um, but I think continue to do what you guys are doing. I, I think it's very compelling. I think it's um, inspiring to me. And it should be inspiring to the people that you're speaking to. And if you can give them any insight into actually what has been happening, why, not, not necessarily the, the, the big decisions, but understanding that there aren't people that are adept at doing the job, right? I always tell people, just do your damn job. Do your job. And that's whether you're the backup point guard for the Sixers or you're running for office, right? I, I want you to do your job. And, and I've been chastised for this. But when people ask me why I voted for Trump in 2016, I didn't like Donald Trump. Hell, I don't know him, but I didn't like his personality and I didn't get along. Like he wasn't a guy that I would want to have a beer with. Like he wasn't that guy for me. But all I cared about was could he do the job? I don't care if he banged 10 hookers or, you know, cheated on his taxes. I don't care about any of that. Are you good at your job? Because if I'm dying of cancer, the best cancer doctor did a line of blow right before he operated on me to save my life. As long as he's the very best, I could care less. Yeah. Yep. Let's just do your damn job, right? So for me, to have people that are able to do the job, but then do it with passion and conviction and a and a desire to do it for the, the people that they represent and not make that lip service is key. And I see that in both of you. And I think that's important to say. And I, I hopefully when you know people see this and hear this episode, they they got that too. And and excuse my couple first words there. I tried to keep this so they could use it for their own stuff. But again, it's an hour. You can't expect me to not cuss in an hour. <laughs> Such a high expectation. Jim, do you have any closing uh, remarks that you'd like to make? Uh, so Matt, again, thanks for uh, supporting us and bringing us on your show. Um, I, I love the questions he asked. I mean, even going down to our families, you know, and our and how we are as fathers. I mean, 
I think that's a lot of things that are overlooked, right? That people don't ask about, you know, a candidate in this day and age. You know, so parenting is huge, right? Um, you know, all I would say is, you know, we would appreciate anybody that lives, your audience that lives in Upper Providence Township that are that are Republican voters that, um, to get out on May 18th, support Tom and I, and uh, so we can help change this township um, for the better um, and give it back to the residents um, and take it away from the developers. Our website is um, whiteyeagerupt.com. And we're on Facebook as well on, um, under White and Jaeger UPT. Um, appreciate the followers and uh, we appreciate the resident support. Anybody who has questions, feel free to reach out to us. We get back to everybody. And um, I'll turn it back to you, Matt, or over to Tom. Now, Tom, did you have any uh, final remarks for the, for the people that are listening to this? Yeah, I mean, Jim's spot on. I'm not going to repeat what he said because he and I are arm in arm in this thing. We're here for the we're here for the taxpayers. We're here for the residents. Um, you know, we're going to lay it all on the field. We're going to fight as hard as we can. Jim and I said, you know, we don't want it to be May 18th and, and the results be unfavorable and us say, man, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. You know, we're committed to each other. We're pushing each other into this for you, for the for the taxpayers, because we're passionate about everything we've talked about here. We, we're passionate about getting in there and, and doing it a little bit different, asking the right questions and, and, and you know, use some critical thinking and, and use some planning and, and uh, you know, be, be a little bit more fiscally responsible in this township. So uh, very excited about that. Also want to say thank you to you for your service. Thank you appreciate both that. as a police yep. officer Absolutely. and as a military. Really appreciate that. Um, we, you know, we're, we're, uh, pro the police and, and really respect what you do. So thank you for your service and thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Everybody hang tight. You guys will talk off air. Um, everybody, thank you for listening to this episode, the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Matt Kubler. Thank you again to Jim White, Tom Yeager. Don't forget to go to White Yeager, U-P-T, that's Uniform Papa Tango dot com. Um, to learn more about them, to get more information on their campaign. Um, if you live in Upper Providence Township, Montgomery County, not Delaware County, um, please get out and vote for both of them. Um, it's important that we have people like Tom and Jim in local office, um, especially now after what we've just gone through in the last you know, 18 months. I think it's important that we, we take back um, the power. The power of the people starts on our local grassroots level. Uh, once again, if you want to learn more about me, go to mattkubler.com. You can learn more about my book, A Brother's Love, A Memoir. Um, and you can uh, make sure that if you go to YouTube, which is Matt Kubler, um, make sure you click the subscribe and that little notification dingy bell thing. And uh, that helps me as well. Um, so everybody take care. God bless. Go out, be kind to one another.